This lecture is going to be about fish. And so like for the other lectures, I want to give you a place-based introduction to fish, like I will do so for all of the other lectures. And with fish, I can fortunately stay with my cabin because that's really the reason I go to my cabin is to go fishing. At least that's what I did when I was a kid. Now I go there for many reasons, of course. So one of the uh, coolest, more primitive fishes are the lampreys. In lampreys, they don't have a jaw. Instead, they have an oral disc. And they have some really interesting life histories. For example, a lot of the species are anadromous. That is, they go to the ocean and they come back into fresh water where they breed, that lay their eggs, and then the babies live for a while in fresh water. So, at our cabin uh, is one of the places where lampreys spawn, and then you can get uh, lamprey babies, which are a different form called an amacete. So, uh, the kids just found one here, and so let's take a look at it. So this is a lamprey amosite, but it's beginning to change into the size and shape that will go a long migration, hundreds of kilometers down to the ocean, where it will then uh, take up a parasitic life cycle in the ocean. In the sand and gravel and mud of many northern rivers, there are a lot of lamprey that are there for up to seven years, living a filter feeding life cycle as an amosite and then they'll all metamorphose, go out to the ocean, become parasitic on other fish, get really big, and then swim all the way, hundreds of kilometers, back up these rivers to spawn and lay their eggs back in their uh, natal streams. You can have these large families of otters that we see with this very strange behavior where they're sort of rolling and turning and diving down in the water. And I'd been recording this for a long time, thinking they were just playing, not sure what was going on. And then I took this video and zoomed in on and slowed down uh, what they were doing when they came up. You see it chewing right there. And I realized that what they're almost certainly doing here is eating lampreys. They're digging them up from the bottom, from the sandy bottom and the muddy bottom where just the same place as our kids find them and uh, pulling them up to the surface and eating them and going down and doing it again and again and again. So here are a bunch of baby coho salmon, juvenile uh, coho salmon called par that are hanging out in a shallow area of the stream. Now, coho salmon are really famous for occupying these little side channels that get isolated from the main stream and just hanging out there for most of the summer until the water levels increase and then they can go back out into the main stream and the following spring migrate to the ocean where they will take on an anadromous life cycle. So here are a bunch of uh, coho salmon sped up so you can see how they're holding their position in the current, using their caudal fins at the end, anal fin on the bottom with the white line, which is what tells you it's a coho salmon, among other things. And you can see all the little fine fin movements that help to maintain their position as they're foraging in the, uh, the slight current. So these are pink salmon that are swimming up the stream on their way back uh, to their natal, that is their home spawning areas, in uh, headwater streams like where our cabin is. These migrations are very difficult for salmon and they have to overcome many obstacles. These salmon, for instance, have migrated several hundred kilometers up the Skeena River to get to our cabin here. They have to overcome many obstacles, most obviously are waterfalls. And so you hear, here you see pink salmon that are attempting to leap, leap up a waterfall that is just upstream of our cabin. Waterfalls are also places where animals and people have long uh, been able to exploit salmon uh, and indigenous people in particular traditionally would use nets and gaffs to harvest salmon. Coho salmon, which really like to spawn in shallow waters, have to encounter beaver dams. So here's a very small beaver dam that the salmon are surmounting without much trouble. But there are larger beaver dams that often have shallow water below them that make it hard for the salmon to get up. And so I have this video of uh, a whole bunch of salmon trying to leap over this one waterfall. And as you can see, many of them don't make it. Some of them get kind of stranded and I was watching and got kind of nervous at this poor salmon. And so I tried to put it back in the water. Uh, I wanted to put it upstream, but it ended up downstream. Sometimes they make it. And so here you can see that they leap up out of the water so they can jump the really fast part of the main current. And then they land on the top and swim really, really hard to make it up above the waterfall. Here's what it looks like uh, from uh, underwater. In every second year, 
we see large numbers of pink salmon. Pink salmon are only here every second year because they have a strict two-year life cycle where they always mature at two years of age. And so in odd years, you might have a lot of salmon and then not in even years, simply because the odd year run is strong and the even year run is not, and they never intermix. Now at our cabin this year, 2021, there were very large numbers of salmon spawning at this point. So let's first take a top-down view. So here you see a number of females with their attendant males that are building and defending their nests, which are called reds. Now, the females will remain relatively stationary. That is, they'll occupy an area of maybe four meters square, maybe a bit bigger, where they defend that area from encroaching female so that those females don't dig on top of their own eggs and remove them from the gravel. Meanwhile, males are tend to be more mobile, where there are groups of males that are attending to individual females in a structure that we'll talk about in a minute. So most of the movement here is the males moving around. Now in this next uh, clip, you can see some of the behaviors of the females on the right. The female is digging in the gravel to prepare a little egg pocket of large rocks for her eggs. And so you can see there's large rocks in the bottom and the female is probing her anal fin into those rocks presumably testing to make sure that they are of the quality of uh, preparation that she wants. Meanwhile, all those males behind her are jockeying to be close to her for the precise moment at which she actually spawns. Now, these males are getting really intense about it. The male in front is the alpha male. He's the dominant male. And the ones behind are subordinate males who are trying to get in just as quickly to fertilize the eggs when she releases those eggs. Meanwhile, the larger male is trying to make sure that they don't get close so he can fertilize most of the eggs. This level of excitement among the males can become quite disruptive for the females. Now here the female is a little bit out of the nest, let the males calm down, and now she's gonna go back in and decide that I'm gonna spawn, the other male rushes in really quickly, and then all the other males try to get in there too. So let's slow this down and take a closer look. So here the female is putting her vent to release her eggs down the bottom. The dominant male sees that, rushes forward, and releases a little squirt of milt or sperm to fertilize the eggs. Meanwhile, the other males rush in and try to share in the action. Here's another angle at the same thing. You can see the female moving over, and they're doing what's called gaping, uh, either to synchronize their behavior or perhaps to help hold them in position where they both release uh, their gametes they're fertilized, and the other males rush in in hopes of getting a little bit of the fertilization opportunity. Now, the female then has released her eggs, which are presumably fertilized by the male. You can see a few eggs uh, washing away in the current, and so now she has to cover them up quickly. So she does what's called covering digs. She moves forward and from various angles and just kicks lightly at the gravel to put slightly smaller rocks on top, and then if we speed this up, we can see the female doing this many, many times and layers of smaller gravel accumulating on top of the larger rocks that are housing the egg pocket in which she's placed her eggs. Tens to hundreds of thousands of pink salmon that are in this river right now, including maybe a thousand just on our property, are all gonna die within a week. So they started spawning about a week ago and they're gonna be done within a week. They're all dead. The male who has spawned, you can see how much uh, effort he put in with his tail, and now he's just slowly dying. And a bear or a eagle or something is going to have a really nice dinner. Thousands, tens of thousands will all be like this within a week. The stink, the stink will be amazing. And everything around here will basically home in and use them for, for food. I wanted to give anecdotes about several of the other fish that are found uh, around our cabin. These are white fish here, and what it's doing is it's going around where the pink salmon have been laying their eggs, and it's uh, siphoning up eggs off the bottom as well as insects, which is its normal diet when the salmon are not spawning. But when the salmon are there, everything wants to eat their eggs. Then, of course, the salmon need to make it all the way out when they... Uh, transition from par into what's called a smolt, which are the downstream migrants toward the ocean. 
and they need to run a gauntlet of predators such as northern pike. You can see the all the fins toward the back. So this is an ambush sit and wait predator that waits until a salmon gets close and then really quickly uh, propulses itself forward to catch that uh, salmon. But nowadays, a lot of my effort is directed toward research on stickleback. This is a three-spined stickleback found in a lake in Haida Gwaii, which is not that far from our cabin, and it's tending its nest. So it has opened up its nest a little bit, and now it is using its fins to pass water over it and thereby make sure they have enough oxygen. Stickleback males are the caregivers here, where the females just come in, deposit their eggs, the males then release sperm over the eggs and then look after the nest and the eggs and the babies.